Good evening. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to the book of Luke. Our text will be Luke 16, but we're going to start in Luke 14. It is always a delight when pastor asks you to speak, and yet the challenge is studying for weeks, you get your reservoir so full and then you only have so many minutes, you have to organize it, communicate it, and not forget anything, which most assuredly won't happen. This morning, I had my notes written, and this morning I was re-looking at them, and there was a word that popped out in our text that I hadn't seen with the same clarity. And I thought, well, i got to go back and rewrite. You know how hard that is when you write your notes? I need to get to the current century and do the iPad thing like pastor does and then just scroll and everything is neat and tidy, but I'm not there yet. Luke chapter 14, the text we're going to be in, Jesus is speaking to multitudes and he's speaking in parables. And parables are stories that Christ tells with the purpose of what? Giving us clarity to even what Dave, Pastor Dave talked about this morning, knowing Christ. We don't want to just know facts and details. We want to know God. Well, Christ clarified some of the wrong thinking through stories, through these parables. This is what God is like. This is what man is like. This is, the kingdom of heaven is like. And then he'll tell a story to give a more crystal view of what it looks like. And in chapter 14, verse 25... And there went a great multitude, there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them. So here we have great multitudes, which comprises who? A lot of everybody, just I would assume a cross section of the whole community. So that's who he's, he's speaking to there. Listen to him talk about, in this text, the cost of following Christ. What king goeth to make, in verse 31, maketh war against another king, sitteth down not first, and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So Jesus uses this illustration to help them get a better view of what the relationship between a disciple of Christ and Christ looks like. And he goes on in, verse 5, in chapter 15. Now who is he speaking to? Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners. Okay, so this is a group he's speaking to. And also, verse 2, Pharisees and scribes were there because they were murmuring. This man receiveth sinners. Okay, so what is he talking about in, in these groups of Scripture? He's talking initially about a lost sheep. What will a shepherd do with one lost sheep? He has a hundred, one is lost. He goes out and fervently looks and finds it in verse 7. It says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. So he's giving them a picture of what? eternal things, what heavenly things, what spiritual things look like. He goes on further and talks about a lost coin. Women, a woman sweeping her house finally finds a coin that she lost. What does she do? She calls her neighbors and they celebrate. Likewise, I see in you there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. So just like this lady found a coin and celebrated, in heaven there's great celebration when one lost soul comes. So Jesus is giving them pictures of what spiritual things look like. He goes on, a very familiar passage, about the lost son. The prodigal son comes and tells dad, I wish you were dead. Give me all that belongs to me. And he goes out and squanders his living. Comes to himself, the elder brother. We have the whole dynamic of that story. But you get a picture of this is what the father looks like. You have the older brother, you have the Pharisees, and then you have these publicans and sinners. And you have what God wants us to see, a view of what eternity looks like with God's, God's view. 
And the father concludes in verse 32, it's, it was meet that we should make merry. For thy brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. So Jesus uses very easy to understand pictures to help these folks, and in turn us, understand more deep spiritual matters. And then we get to our text, chapter 16. And I will point out first, who is he talking to here? And he said this to his disciples. Now, do we assume the multitude, the Pharisees and scribes all left? No, because they show up in verse 14. The Pharisees also heard these things and they derided him. But this portion is spoken to, we're told, the disciples. So let's begin reading in verse, verse 1. And he said also this unto his disciples. There was a certain rich man which had a steward. And the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then he said, Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write fourscore. And the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful... In that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity with which you communicate to us that we may learn more of you, learn what you are like, and see ourselves and see what you would have us to change, what you'd have us to improve, and what you'd have us to turn from. Lord, I ask that you would take this text, this frail servant and use your word to speak to us, to change us, to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and transform us into more accurate servants. I ask in Christ's name. Amen. So in this text, we have two main characters. We have the master, the rich man, and you have a steward. Then you have other characters as well, but the two main characters would be the master and the steward. And what what is a steward? It's not a word we use a lot now. It's a whole concept that we don't even deal with much in our day or our country. What is a steward? Well, I'm glad we're going over this because none of you know. A steward, what does a steward own? Let me ask a simpler question. What does a steward own? He takes care of his master's goods. Yes, thank you very much. That's what a steward does. So in here we have, what is, what would, if we read this, God is the master. We would be the steward. Okay, so as we walk through this, think of that. Put your steward shoes on 
and look at this text envisioning that. You represent the steward and God is our master. What, is there a steward that comes to mind in Scripture? Okay, I'll quit asking questions because you all don't say anything. A steward is an administrator, a person who manages the domestic affairs of a family, business, house manager, or overseer. A steward may own some things, but in the context of a stewardship, he owns nothing. He is a slave, a very respected slave, very intelligent, very uh, bright slave, but nonetheless, he's a slave. He owns nothing. Do you remember this? In Potiphar's house, Joseph was brought down to Egypt. Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian brought him out of the hands of Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. And he made him overseer of his house, again, steward of his house. And all that he had, he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left, listen to this, he left all that he had in Joseph's hand and knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat. So stewards, though they owned nothing, had quite authority, quite responsibility, as Joseph did. He could buy and sell and trade and manage the other servants to care for Potiphar's house. Well, in our text here in Luke, in a similar fashion, that's the steward. Owns nothing, but he's caring for the affairs in a very powerful way of his master. And what I want us to do is just walk through this verse by verse. Sometimes I've talked with folks, and it can get challenging with some of the wording in that. But hopefully we can bring clarity to that tonight. Verse 1, there was a certain rich man which had a steward. The same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. So whatever that means, the master was brought to his attention that this steward was a thief, was embezzling, was mismanaging, was doing something, but it was brought to the owner's attention that this steward was a problem. He had wasted his goods. So he does what any good owner would do in that situation. He called him in to explain himself. And he called him in and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no longer be a steward. And a couple things I want us to note here, and I'm, trying, I'm going to try to attach some application as we go. Who did the master call for to give an account? The steward. Who else? Nobody. He called him. He didn't call them. He called him. He called him to give an account. And what does that instantly take my mind to? When you and I stand before God and give an account for my stewardship, who's going to be with there with? Who's going to be with me there? No one. No one. And I want us to put those shoes on as we walk through this and think about that. This master heard the steward wasn't being honorable, called him in. One day that will be you and I. And we will be there alone. And we will be asked to give an account. And it's asking but not really asking we will have to give an account for how well we stewarded what we are given. Do we all agree that we own nothing? Okay. I think in this room, in this setting, it's real easy for us to say, oh, yes, we own nothing. I'm merely a steward. But Monday through Saturday, it seems a little more challenging, doesn't it? We have our stuff, and we can get pretty controlling of our stuff. Well, hopefully this text will help us with that. We're stewards of the master's stuff. 
The master called him alone to give an account. And secondly, I don't want to miss this either. What was he going to give an account for? His stewardship. Who else's? Nobody's. And this is something that I think we get distracted with. I get distracted with it. I'll look at someone else's life, and I'll start thinking I have better ideas than they do. You guys ever do that? Oh, why would pastor do that? Well, when Pastor Snowd gives an account for this church, who will be there with him? I won't. So why would Kurt busy Kurt's mind with critiquing someone else's stewardship? I'm going to have my own hands full answering for me. And we're, we're told that. This master calls this steward to give an account for his stewardship. Let's not just read past that and miss, miss it. I fail to focus my attention on the areas under my control, yet I busy myself inspecting the areas under someone else's control. Why would I do that? Why do you do that? Can we stop doing that? As I was studying, I, I remember in John chapter 21, you remember when Jesus was still with the disciples and Peter talked to Jesus and he said, what about John? What's John going to do? Remember that? What did Jesus tell him? Don't worry about John, Peter. If I had leave John here forever, what difference does that make to you, Peter. And as I was studying this, exactly, Peter's stewardship, he'll give an account for alone. Why worry about John's? And so I try to put those shoes on my feet. Kurt, why do you worry about someone else's? What they do, what they don't do, how they do what they do. You worry about what God has given you responsibility for. And get busy with it. And I... Sadly, we can distract ourselves with the laundry list of talents that we don't have. The long list of possessions that I don't have. And I can be distracted with the long, long list of possessions and skills that you all have. Well, yeah, they've, they've I bet a lot will be expected of them because look at all the stuff they have. I give very little attention, sadly, to the talents and possessions that I do have. Why is that? I will never give an account for the talents someone else has, the stewardship someone else has. But I most assuredly will give an account for the stewardship I have. What have I done with what I have been given? In Romans 14, 12, we're told, I will give an account to God for the stewardship of Kurt. No one else. And our steward, as we go on to read in this text, did not seem to be distracted with wondering who else was going to come, did he? The steward right away starts recognizing he's going to give an account all alone. So what should I do? Verse 3. The steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I can't dig. To beg, I'm ashamed. So whether he was too old, too frail, too lazy to dig, to work manually, I don't know. He was too ashamed to beg, I don't know. But I love what he said. What shall I do? That is a splendid question. Are you asking yourself this question? In your little world, whatever is going on in your world, 
the, the joys, the pains, the challenges, the difficulties, the strife, your world, what all that looks like, is your question, what shall I do? Or is it, what is somebody else going to do for me? Are we asking this? One day, this guy's stewardship's going to come to a close, right? <laughs> In our text, likely very soon. When is your stewardship going to come to a, con a conclusion? When we die, I, exactly. When is that? Could be today. Could be 50 years from now. I have no idea. You younger ones could be 80 years from now. I don't know. But it most certainly will come to a close. And do we view that? I heard a, pe a speaker talk years ago, and he said, don't ever forget your last appointment. Your last appointment is this one. You're given account for your stewardship. And yet we can waltz through life somewhat ignorant about that last appointment. But I love him asking, what shall I do? What should I be doing? The setting I'm in, the challenges that surround me, what should I do? And I got inspired when I wrote this down. If we sat down with you tonight and audited your books, you would come before us and give us an account of how you spent every minute of your day and every dollar of your account. Does that make you feel warm inside? It didn't me. <laughs> I just thought, I thought, whoa, and there's no way I'm going to do that. But I just thought, if, if I'm instructed as we are, 1 Corinthians 4, 2 says, moreover, it is required in a steward that a man be found Faithful. Okay. God already requires me to be faithful in this stewardship. Why would I not willingly sit down amongst my brothers and sisters and say, this is my life. This is what I'm doing. This is how I'm stewarding, managing God's time, talents, and treasures. Yet we're not comfortable with that, are we? Well, hopefully we can get comfortable at that. Because one day you will give an account, and it will be before a much more um, powerful individual than anybody in this room. We are to be faithful. And he asked what he should do. And in verse 4, he, he knew what he should do. That when I'm put out, he knew he was done, so he knew he was unfaithful. When I put out, I may be received into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, How much owest thou? Said an, a hundred measures of oil. Sit down quickly and write fifty. Then to another, a oh, hundred measures of wheat. Write four score. This steward knew he had not been faithful, and he will shortly be removed from his position. I want us to notice several elements. Clearly, we see what he did. There was a 100, 100 measure bill, right, right, 50. 100 measures of wheat, right, 80. So he reduced everybody's bill. But a few things I want us to notice, and again, looking at your stewardship, looking at my stewardship, he called. Pardon me? He could, no, he wasn't calling for the children. All of these debtors, he took the initiative. And, and as, as I'm looking at that, do we take the initiative to get involved in people's lives to give them out of our stuff? Oh, of course we do. Don't you? My phone rings off the hook all the time. People wanting to share their belongings with me. Why not? It just, it just struck. He called. This is a steward. And he knew he needed to minister to the lives of these people that they receive him in the future. 
So he called them. Well, Kurt, I, w- I would minister to people with my things if God brought them into my life. That's not what this guy did. He didn't stroll down the marketplace and wait to bump into one of the debtors. Hey, hey, come here. I think you, you owe my master some stuff, don't you? Here, let's see what we can work out. He took the initiative to reach into people's lives to be a blessing to them. Do we? Well, if I had that much stuff, I would. Be careful. The text goes on to say, if you're not faithful with a little, who's going to give you a lot? If you're not faithful with the stupid stuff of this earth, who's going to give you spiritual things that matter? So do you, do I, take the initiative to reach out to people and get involved in their lives, initiate the interaction? And then he goes on in verse, every one, every one of his debtors, who did he leave out? Nobody. And again, we can get, we can get pretty uh, self-absorbed, but I don't mean just Kurt, but Kurt's little group, Kurt's family, Kurt's close buddies. That's not what we see here. He called all of them. If I can be a blessing to you with this stuff, I'm going to be. Is that your heart? Is that my heart with the stuff that we manage? Because again, let's stop. Who does this stuff belong to? God. It belongs to God. Why did God give it to you and to me? To manage, to steward, to be a blessing to others with. Is that what we're doing? I hope. I hope that's what this guy was doing and was shortly here in a few verses commended for. So he called, took the initiative. He didn't leave anybody out. He went to everyone. Verse 6, it says, sit down quickly. What does that mean? This is not a tricky question. He fast. He was in a hurry. I need to get busy blessing people. Is that you? Is that me? Am I seeking to take the initiative to everybody around me and quickly bless them with the things God has given me to steward? That seems to be what we're being taught here in this text. Quickly. How many more lives would you be involved in if you knew your stewardship was going to be given account tonight? Kurt, none. Great. If you're busy honoring this, praise the Lord. But if we're not, I'd ask us to do business with that. And he was was generous, wasn't he? Take your bill, mark out 100, and put 50. woo Well, it wasn't his stuff, Kurt. Neither is anything you have. And that's what I keep going back to. And there was a war in my mind as I'm reading this. Well, if it wasn't my stuff, I could be that generous too. Well, be careful, because it isn't your stuff. Why can't you be that generous? If this person can be blessed with that thing... Oh, you know how hard I work for that? Then we're missing the point. God gave it to you to bless people with. But in our mind, in our Americanized mind, it's mine. And I need, I need to manage it well to be given an inheritance to my kids and my grandkids. Yeah. Okay, there's, there's Bible for that, and I won't dismiss that. But we, you're thinking, people, what does this say? If we're stewards of this, and the example was, this, he was commended for this behavior, what does that mean for us? It's commendable behavior. He was very generous. These things were under his scope of responsibility and authority, and he was not stingy in any way. And in my preparation, I came across a 
a story G. Campbell Morgan wrote uh, in a text he had written. He said uh, he related an experience he once had while staying in the home of a wealthy Christian. One morning at family prayers, this devoted church member eloquently and tenderly prayed for the salvation of the heathen and for the missionaries. When his prayers were finished, the father was startled beyond measure when one of his boys, a lad of 10, said to his father, Dad, I like to hear you pray for the missionaries. The pleased father replied, I am glad you do, my boy. Then the boy replied, somewhat to the chagrin of his father, But do you know what I was thinking when you were praying? That'd scare any dad, wouldn't it? If I had your bank book, I would answer half of your prayers. And I stopped and thought, that stings a bit. Because how many, just like when Josue was here last, was it last week, two weeks ago, I lose track of time. He's like, man, I could put a thousand people in this room. And we're thinking, oh, where do I put my stuff? We need like three or four of these chairs for my wife and I to sit because we need to be, boy. Yeah, Wanda, you and Paul are spread out pretty far. <laughs> no, but why do, we, why do we do this? Why do we think like this? If I had your bank book, Dad, I would answer half of your prayers. And so do we behave as a steward or as a selfish owner? In our text, the steward was generous, he was inclusive, and he was prompt. And I would encourage us to be the same. Then in verse 8, this is the verse that challenged some as the steward was commended. And the Lord commended the unjust steward. Whoa! Whoa! He was a crook. He was a thief. What in the world did he commend him for? Well, we're, we're told. Because he had done wisely, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Let's just stop there. Was Jesus commending the unjust steward for theft? That's an easy question. Does the Bible promote theft? Ever? No. So we know Jesus is not commending the steward for being a thief. He was commended because he did wisely. And in verse 9, we're go, we'll go on to see more of that. But he, would, he used the material possessions at his disposal to impact eternal life. People are acting to realize immediate pleasures all around us rather than presently investing for the future. Our steward had likely in his life behaved for immediate gain, which had placed him in his current predicament. But now he realized the need to immediately invest only for the future. He had taken materials that he had responsibility for and authority over and used them to make friends. Can we see that as a goal of the stuff that we have? The talents we've been given, the resources we've been given, the properties that we have been given, all of these things, whatever it is in your life, we have been given much. Well, he's been given more. Okay? He'll give an account for his more. You'll give an account for whatever you have. If you're a ten-talent guy, you're going to answer for ten talents. If you're a one-talent or a two-talent guy, how many talents will you answer for? That one or two. But you will answer for those. Let's be faithful with those. A passage or portion of this that grieved me was the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. So the lost heathens behave more wisely with their things than believers did. And I would just add, I, I can't go back and address any of that with these folks, but we can look at it for us. Is that true? Are you generous? 
we had a recently had a chaplain conference and I talked to the one of the the ladies we were dealing with at the hotel there was 150 140 chaplains from 10 states that showed up and she said you know what my staff is constantly telling me what a delight it is to have you guys here oh, praise God that's what we want to hear we're leaving uh, tips in the in the room we're we're tipping at the we're just trying to be a blessing to these people again using this you guys use stupid in, in your house can I use that word <laughs> to use the stupid things of this earth the things that will burn to use those things to bless these people's lives when Levon and I first got to that hotel there was this lady coming up clearly beat from a long day's work and I just said hey I appreciate you working so hard to take care of us while we're here. And she looked at me like I made her whole day just by saying, hey, I notice you and I care about you. That didn't, I didn't even, that didn't cost me anything. But that's the kind of heart that a Christian should have that this text says the world outdoes us in some of this stuff. Let's not that... Let's not allow that to be the case. Wow, what a, what a smack that would have been for Jesus to tell me these lost people are better at this than you. Well, let that not be said. Let that not be said of us. And again, what, what should we do? <laughs> Verse 3. Okay, Lord, what shall I do? What shall I do? How shall I use my things to be the blessing that you intend me to be. Verse 9, he says, And I say unto you, this is Jesus now giving the instruction, Make to yourself friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, when you fail, what does that mean? When your stewardship is over, when you're done, when you're over and you're giving account, that the people, the friends you made, may receive you into everlasting habitations. Well, there's some some illusion there that these people we impact will welcome us into heaven. Kurt, what does that look like? I don't know, but I'm kind of excited to see. So I would like all of us, myself included, to use, as we're told, the mammon of unrighteousness. The mammon, the stuff, the monies, the talents, the time, the things of this earth. Use those things to make friends. These are eternal souls, eternal souls that we bump into every day. Some are in our home. There's many outside of our home. And do we see them as objects to bless? I hope. I hope we do. And I would just ask, would you specifically spend some time examining how you obey this? We're commanded to do it. How well are you doing? We're in different areas. Uh, I, we've got old people, maybe your great-grandparents, I don't know. And we've got young people with brand-new kids and everybody in between. We've got single people, married people, big families, little families, influential people, less influential. I don't, I don't care because each of us will give an account for where you are. Well, I, I'm only this. Okay, you're only that, but you better be the best only that you can be. And don't worry about, well, she has all this, this, and this. Great, that she's going to give an account for all this, this, and this. And you won't. But you will give an account for what you do with what you have responsibility over. That when we fail, when our stewardship will be evaluated, and again, what do we own? Nothing. I'd love, I'd love that truth to get in this thick head. I'm a steward of all of it. I don't own any of it. When our final day of accounting comes, these lives will welcome us into our eternal dwelling. I've shared this story before, uh, but to me it's so so applicable here when our boys I don't know sweetie 10 15 years ago our boys were little they played 
string music. One played a banjo, one played a mandolin, one played a guitar. And they could tear it up pretty good. And we took him to a, a concert in a, in a venue about the size of this church, maybe a little smaller. And this group was up, and they're playing and singing. And uh, my middle son played the guitar. Luke played the guitar. He leaned over. He said, Dad, do you, do you hear that guitar? Yeah. Sounds nice. Oh, no, Dad. That's, that's got to that's, that's be a pre-war Martin. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. <laughs> pre-war Martin, before World War II, a Martin was a brand. Very nice guitar. The older it gets, the more rich and beautiful it sounds. He said, that's, that's got to be one of those. Okay. Well, at the end of the concert, the boys, Dad, can we go talk to the band. Well, normally I didn't, we didn't do that, but it was small enough. I thought, yeah, go ahead. So the boys go marching up, and before long, I see Jeff's playing this guy's mandolin, and Kyle's playing this guy's banjo, and Luke's just tearing this guitar apart, just, just playing. All three of them are playing, and I end up talking to the, the band leader. He comes over and says, hey, they're pretty good. I might fire my group and hire your boys. Okay, ha ha, that's cute. Oh, that, that guitar your boy's playing? He turned down $50,000 for that because it's worth more. So as a dad, what do you instantly think? <laughs> when you see your 10-year-old just, they call it shredding, I guess. That's a good thing. He's just shredding this guitar. What is my thought? John, what would you think if that was Alex? Put the thing the tough part is, I'm back there, and Luke's up here. And is Luke looking at me? <laughs> no, no, no. So I'm trying to get his attention, like, son, we got to put this thing down. And the boys are playing, and, and I'm trying to get his attention. Well, then the, the guy that owned the guitar sees me trying to get Luke's attention. So he starts standing in between me and Luke, and I thought, you booger. <laughs> Well, he made his way to me, and we, we started talking. Oh, your boy's really enjoying the guitar. That's great. I'm glad to do that. And I said, yeah, it sounds like it's pretty. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty nice guitar. And, and he said, I'm happy to let your boy play that. Tears me up every time I think of it. He said, it's just a thing. And I'm thinking, but it's a $50,000 thing. <laughs> and he said, if I can take that guitar and, and bless your son, he didn't know us from Adam. Who's going to take a $50,000 instrument and give it to a 10-year-old kid and say, have fun? This guy. And I thought, this guy understood this. I don't. I struggle to let him play with a $500 toy I have. Why? I wish I had that guy's name. I don't. Wouldn't know him if I saw him. But he grasped this text. If I can take a thing... That, that Martin guitar... If Luke broke it, could he replace it? No. They don't make them anymore. He didn't care. If he could be a blessing to that little boy, he would happily do that. And I'm sure my boys still remember that. And I hope I never forget it when I have an opportunity, hopefully to take initiative and be generous, and be inclusive with the stuff I have authority over, to do that. Because what it, that act changed my life. And that's what this text is saying. Use these things to transform people's lives. Oh, 
Think I'm going to let somebody, some snot-nosed punk do that? Really? That guitar one day will burn. That 10-year-old boy will not. And in our lives, what do we have that we could be a blessing to others with? And are we? And that guy's heart was so sweet. It's like, I'll do this all day long. Don't stop him from, look at him. He's having a ball. Don't stop him from doing that. And then I come to a text like this. And it says, you do that. You take the mammon of unrighteousness and make friends. Wow. I need this. Do I hold my possessions? And again, are they my possessions? No. But for the sake of understanding, do I hold my possessions this loosely? Do I even remember that these are actually the Lord's? And I'm merely a slave who's responsible to steward them. What would God want me to do with this? That's how we need to view the items in our care. Use the resources that will burn to make friends that will not. And then verse 10, 11, and 12. He that is faithful in much. I'm sorry. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, there we have that term again, who will commit to your trust true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? So to summarize those, are you and I being faithful with what God has already given you? Well, Curdy hasn't given me much. Okay, that's not even a point. Are you faithful with what you have? The answer is yes or no. If you are, the master will share more, will give you responsibility for more. And if you're faithful which that, with that which is important, they may, he may even entrust to you spiritual. What does the text say? Uh, Spiritual riches, right? True riches in verse 11. Who will commit to you true riches, eternal riches, spiritual riches? If you can't be faithful with the nuts and bolts and materials and money and lands of this, who's going to trust you with lives and souls? So may I encourage us as fervently as I know how to be faithful with the stuff that's going to burn anyway. The comforts, the, the American mind. I have so much of that in my own mind that I'd like to separate from what is God saying. I love America. I love being here. I love the freedoms we enjoy. But somehow, sometimes I think that blurs into my understanding of what God expects. And I don't want that to be the case. And then it concludes, our text, will, our passage will conclude in verse 13. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. You're either serving the master faithfully, or you're not. And it grieves me because I know sometimes it's like we, we want to have this third column. Well, I'm not really super faithful, but I'm certainly not a heathen. So I'm kind of in here. Well, that in here column only exists in your mind. You either are a faithful servant, a faithful steward, or you're not. And I read this, and I share this with you, and it convicts me. 
Would I want anyone to look at how I spend every moment of my day? Open my checkbook and see every charge. What was that for? Why would God want you to do that? <laughs> I remember when LaVon and I were first married, I could kind of get things I wanted. And then she matured faster than I did. And she just came to the point, was like, honey, you do what you believe God would have you do. Oh, no. Boy, that cut right to the issue, didn't it? Kurt, you do what you will happily stand before God and say, I was faithful. And she was like, whatever that is, I'm good. Good for her, because that put the weight on me that should have been there. We are responsible for that. There is no third class. Cannot. There's no option. You cannot serve God and mammon. It is absolutely impossible for me to be the servant of God and at the same time servant to mammon, the stuff. The steward in our text realized that his day of accounting was very near and he moved quickly and decisively. Dear friends, our day of accounting is also approaching quickly. And there is no time to lose to put your affairs in order. May we indeed found, be found to be faithful stewards. Let's pray.